Uh, colleagues, let me welcome you to the first meeting in 2016 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may accept, affect the broadcasting system. Uh, agenda item one today is uh, evidence from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. And we are joined today by Bill Thompson, who is the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, Ian Bruce, Public Appointments Manager, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, and Helen Hayne, who is the Investigations Manager at the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life. Uh, do you wish to make an initial statement, Bill? Um, with your permission, Convener. Uh, I am grateful to the Committee for this opportunity to give evidence uh, in relation to the annual report and some other documents and issues which I believe are before you. Uh, my two colleagues are very experienced, having held their roles through the period of office of my predecessors. And before answering your questions, I, I thought it might be helpful briefly to highlight what I consider to be the most significant developments since the period covered by the 2014-15 annual report in terms both of the standards and the public appointments aspects of my remit. The number and range of complaints about the conduct of MSPs have been remarkably constant for a number of years. However, in relation to councillors and the members of public bodies, the already significant volume of complaints has continued to rise since the end of March 2015. Uh, and if the, the increase experienced over the first nine months of the current year is sustained, the outturn will be some 10% up on the previous year. And even though three new investigating officers were recruited uh, in the early summer uh, on a part-time basis and to replace two who had retired, uh, this is putting significant pressure on the resources available to progress investigations. Additionally, our case management system uh, relies on a database developed some 13 years ago. Uh, it's at the limits of its capacity and, frankly, its usefulness. Um, and we've therefore been working on a review with a view to sourcing a new case management system. And I have referred to this in the draft of the strategic plan. Uh, it is one of the key elements um, of our plan to be able to sustain our volume of business going forward. And that, of course, is subject to the funding being available, which is a discussion I will be having with other people. Um, <clears throat> our work on public appointments has also increased, and that is for good reasons. And we're now working more closely with the staff of the Scottish Government on a more strategic approach to the planning of appointments. This involves better preparation for new appointment rounds with public appointments advisors uh, who are contracted to work for my office. Uh, working alongside the public appointments team, uh, the directorates who sponsor public bodies and selection panels themselves. The focus is no longer simply on planning competitions, but now includes planning for succession on boards in their strategic role and their operating context. This informs the planning for the competition uh, and how best to attract and as assess diverse fields of suitable applicants. Uh, I think it is an important development. We have co-produced with the staff of the Government a competency framework which been, has been piloted since the summer of 2015. It assists with the definition of merit in each appointment round and the effective assessment of candidates against the identified criteria. These in turn support the translation into practice of the statutory guidance on the application of the 2013 Code, which I issued in August of 2014. The thematic review published in the autumn of 2015 identified the need for a mechanism to capture and disseminate lessons learned from individual appointment rounds, and I'm pleased to say that the Government has been working on the development of such a process. We've been consulted on the detail, and we expect it to be put into effect in the early part of this calendar year. The lessons learned approach and a number of other topics have been incorporated along with the guidance on merit and most able uh, in a new set of guidance on the 2013 Code on which we have been consulting uh, since early in December, and I hope to be able to finalise that very soon. All the indications are that the new approach to working in partnership with those in the Government who are responsible for public appointments has been well received. I am sure that it is already leading to improvements in the appointments process, 
including better definition of merit by ministers and thereby to the recruitment of suitably able and more diverse appointees. Our work with the Scottish Government on appointments of, is, of course, wider than simply on process improvements, albeit that they are important in themselves. And that, I think, is indicated in my annual report. And that is all I have to say by way of introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, let me, just before we, we move to the questioning we discussed before you came in, uh, to just pick up on the point about the volume of complaints about councillors rising. Um, and I, that is outside the remit of this committee. But I wanted to ask, in that context, whether you think the rule that exists, uh, that it is actually a breach of the code governing the behaviour of MSPs for them to make public that they are making a complaint about a federal colleague, is one that helps keep that volume uh, of uh, complaints at an appropriate level and uh, compare and contrast uh, the situation in relation to councillors? Um, that is, of course, an interesting question. Uh, and as you're well aware, um, I think from memory, there has only been one complaint since the Parliament uh, was inaugurated um, in relation to a breach of that rule, although I may be forgetting something. Um, I think there's been more than one. I think the comparison is not straightforward. Um, the bulk of complaints about councillors and members of public bodies um, are submitted by members of the public who may or may not be politically involved. Um, and of course, it wouldn't be possible for the code to apply directly to those people if they were to complain. So I'm not convinced it would have the same effect um, were it to be translated into the councillor's code or the, the model code for public bodies. Right, that, that, that's helpful. I think we'll, we'll just pass on. I had a personal instinctive view that councillors complaining about councillors was a larger component of it than you've, you've indicated. So, so let's move on to what is actually the remit of uh, this, uh, uh, this committee, and I'll pass the baton to Mary. Initially. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. I wanted to start by asking you a couple of questions around the guidance on the code of practice and specifically in relation to merit and um, most able. Can, can you explain were there specific concerns that prompted you to include merit and most able and if they were, what were they? Um, yes, th there were specific concerns. Um, Merit was introduced um, as a principle, I think, in the 2006 um, iteration of the code. Um, and integrity was introduced in the 2011 revision of the code. Uh, so by the time I came into office, um, both applied, uh, al along with the third principle. Um, it became clear in the course of investigating a particular complaint um, that the information which had gone to the appointing minister, um, well, first of all, it contained a number of errors, which was problematic in itself. Um, but the advice on the options available to the minister um, didn't seem to me to be wholly clear in terms of the implications of the application of the principles of merit and integrity. Um, and I actually set this out um, in the annual report um, in summary form. Um, for those who are interested, it's on page 28 um, of the 1415 annual report. <clears throat> and I thought it would be useful to clarify, and I think it's proven to be welcome uh, by those who use the guidance, I thought it would be useful to clarify the implications of the application of the principle of merit throughout the entire process, i.e. with integrity. Um, and that is what led to the guidance. Uh, I may say I did have some discussion uh, with ministers before I finalised the guidance. So it's not as if it was something that was imposed. 
Um, um, my understanding uh, from discussions I've had is that it was welcomed, um, and that still appears to be the position. Okay. Be because if I look at the, um, the guidance on the 2013 code, and maybe it's just too early in the day for me to fully grasp these things, paragraph 2.2 says merit is defined by the appointing minister at the point at which he or she advises the panel. So is it the appointing minister that decides the merit, or has that been predetermined, or is he given guidance on what that merit should be? I think circumstances vary. Um, the minister is responsible for the appointment mm -hmm. and therefore ultimately is responsible for the criteria which are used and the criteria which are used of course are the definition of merit which then applies throughout the appointment process. Um, there have been some examples of ministers including cabinet secretaries uh, being directly involved in discussions about um, what these criteria should be but I think it is possible that there may be other um, circumstances where the Minister has been presented with suggestions may or may not have commented on them, um, but the Minister certainly, whoever it is, will have to endorse these criteria, and that is the point at which merit is determined mm. for the appointment process. So can, the can I just come in just for clarification? Uh, I see the process as having three parts. The invitation that goes out for people to apply, the selection from those who reply, and then the appointment itself. This all it pre comes before all of that, just to be clear. So yes, right at the outset, the, this process will influence every step of the process. Th that's correct, Convener. The definition of merit, the criteria which are set out, should govern the entire process. Um, it should influence um, the Sorry. way in which the appointment is advertised, it should influence the assessment uh, of candidates and it has to be the, the basis on which the Minister makes the decision at the end of the day. Right, that, that's fine. I, I just wanted in my own head to, to fully clarify, does the decision on merit lie with the Minister or is that predetermined? That's really what I wanted it, to get It lies with the Minister. It lies with the Minister. Very clearly. Yeah, that's fine. And what plans have been put in place to monitor how, th how that will progress and if, if it improves the situation or if further steps are needed to, to change it? I, I think you'll be aware that um, I now categorise um, appointment rounds um, according to the level of risk, uh, which I think applies. Um, and where they are high risk, which usually means also high profile, um, one of the public appointment advisors from my office um, will be involved throughout the entire process and, as I've just said, actually from the pre-planning stage now, um, right up to the point at which um, the assessment is done usually by interview, um, although they're not involved when it's passed to the minister. That's, uh, they're not involved at that stage. Um, in a medium risk round, the advisor is involved up to the conclusion of the planning stage, at which point, if you like, the die is cast. Um, if it is a low risk round, um, my office is not involved. Um, and that is one of the changes that was made in the 2013 code in order that regulations should be proportionate. Um, I, I appreciate that's dependent on the judgment made at the outset, but um, there are I suppose two safety nets there. Um, one is that because of the good working relationship we have with the government staff, um, if they are concerned about things, they will actually pick up the phone to my office uh, and check things out. Um, the other safety net is that, of course, um, people who are aggrieved by the process can make a complaint. Um, and there has been a very small number of complaints. Um, there were two in the year uh, covered by the annual report. I think there have been two... Uh, since then. It's a very small number. Hmm. Can, it, can I just check before we move on? There are also appointments Scottish ministers make that are made under the UK provisions where it's joint boards like the Climate Change Committee as an example. Are you involved in that at all? No, I, I'm only involved in uh, appointments which are regulated under the Act under which I operate. So there are actually Scottish appointments uh, Scotland only appointments which are not regulated um, but I think ministers frequently 
uh, try to use the same process for those appointments, but I, I'm not involved. So you're, you're content that the almost kind of open communication between yourselves and ministers is enough to fully monitor how the merit and most able progresses and yes. is fluid enough to make changes as you go along? I am content. I should say it's not direct communication normally between me and mm. ministers, although I do have some. It's, it's usually mm. through um, the civil service. But yes, I am content with that. Can I move on now to ask you about the thematic review of the operation of, of the Code of, of Practice? Um, and your annual report for 2013-14 showed improvements to the appointments practices had not done enough to achieve the targets set out on diversity delivers. And in the report on the, the, the draft code, committee expressed concern about whether the addition of experience to the criteria for appointment risks discouraging people with relevant skills. I wonder if you could maybe talk us through that a little bit and, and how, how you found the inclusion of experience. Um, I, I think because he's closer to it, I would like to ask Ian Bruce to deal with the detail on that question, if, if you're happy with that. Certainly. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to give evidence to the committee, uh, and good morning. Um, I think when we last gave evidence to the committee, we discussed um, uh, an approach that had been trialled on Fife NHS, um, and it was in relation to a similar question about uh, including experience in person specifications. Uh, and at the time, I think I'd indicated that, um, I mean, certainly the inclusion of experience is going to rule some people out, but equally, um, it should be included with the intention of perhaps ruling people in who are meeting the needs of a board, perhaps in a different way um, to what the committee had anticipated. Um, I think people may feel that asking for experience means asking for people with board experience, and that's certainly not been the intention. Um, the Commissioner mentioned uh, the introduction of the guidance on merit and most able, uh, and really that is fundamentally about meeting board needs um, and um, finding what the Minister wants. Um, so in relation to Fife NHS, they were looking for people who were service users, carers, people who'd perhaps experienced barriers in relation to accessing services. And what we've seen is uh, the inclusion of very similar criteria for selection and many more health board uh, appointment rounds since that time. Um, so rather, in fact, than um, leading to less diverse pools of applicants, we've seen more diverse pools of applicants coming forward. And it obviously varies from board to board. I mean, you're looking at what the board needs, um, and then you're designing criteria around that uh, in order to meet those needs. Um, so, for example, as well as service user experience, um, health boards are now looking for people with track records and in integration of health and social care. And obviously that makes sense in relation to the work that they're now doing with the integration joint boards. Um, but, um, for example, Creative Scotland ran an appointment round. They were looking for people who were passionate about arts and culture in Scotland. Um, and how that should be viewed on the international stage. And again, that's, that's very different to looking for people with um, perhaps experience as board members. So quite the opposite, in fact, and I think the thematic review bore that out. Um, it was leading to more diversification rather than less. So the, the guidance around the application process and what is required through the, the, the definition of experience is clear enough that if it rules people out, it almost rules the right people out, but it allows people to be ruled in? Just so, just so. Um, and, and we have also been working with government on the introduction of a competency framework, which was a recommendation in the um, Diversity Delivers strategy. Um, and, and what that allows panels to do, um, and ministers where, where they are directly involved as well, is be very specific about the sorts of evidence that they are looking for in relation to all the criteria for selection, the level at which they need to be met. Uh, and it really is about meeting very specific needs on boards. We're now seeing competitions where perhaps three board members are sought and the criteria for selection are different for each of those separate positions, which is absolutely right. Uh, and it is about securing more diverse, heterogeneous boards. OK, thank you. Can I ask you now about um, delivering diversity? Because there have been um, 
issues in the past about diverse boards and, and, and appointing a, a broad mix and range of, of people. Um, and, and there have been some concerns expressed about participants' reluctance to embrace the shared commitment. Do you have any um, information you could give us around that and, and what specifically is, is happening and what's been done to improve that? I think in terms of participants' reluctance, um, which was examined through the thematic review, which mm. Ian uh, laid on, I think it would be better if uh, more mm. direct if, if he was to reply to you on that. There is some good news in terms of diversity, but we can come back to that if you mm. wish. Um, it's a very interesting question. I think we all have to bear in mind that public appointments don't operate in isolation. Um, we're talking about a societal issue. Um, and I suppose probably the first thing to point out is that we need to be thinking about diversity in, in two ways. Uh, we included a diagram in the report on the thematic review to try and help people understand what it is that we're talking about. Diversity in its broadest sense goes back to the original question that you asked about you know, whether or not asking for experience is, is, is appropriate and leads to more diverse boards. Diversity in its broadest sense is about the whole range of skills, knowledge, backgrounds, perspectives that, that different people bring to boards. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, there is lots of evidence out there now, um, and it's a great deal of it has been generated since 2008 um, when the Walker Review was published, and that was into the effectiveness of boards for financial institutions. Uh, there's an appendix in there from the Tavistock Institute about um, the effects of groupthink um, and the impact that that has on the ability of boards to appropriately consider risks. Um, but the evidence um, is, is very much pointing to the fact that heterogeneous boards are, are more effective because they consider matters um, and there is perhaps more um, discussion and debate in order to reach appropriate decisions. Um, now, if one contrasts that with homogenous boards, and, and they tend to arise when people are making appointments perhaps in their own image or replacing people on a like-for-like -like basis, um, they have advantages. Um, they tend to reach consensus quite quickly. Perhaps that's unsurprising um, because there's not much dissent there. Um, so that can be relatively comfortable for people. Um, if, if you know much about unconscious bias, you'll be aware that there are in-groups and out-groups. And obviously there can be a tendency to look to recruit to your in-group because that's what you're comfortable with. Um, but that's not necessarily going to lead to the sort of debates and decision-making um, that, that effective boards are good at. Um, so that's diversity in its broader sense. Um, and then over and above that, we need to think about diversity in terms of protected characteristics. Um, and, and to an extent, Diversity Delivers discusses that, and it includes targets for protected characteristics. And we have to bear in mind that, you know, under the Equality Act, um, there's an obligation on public bodies and indeed on the Scottish ministers um, to redress underrepresentation by protected characteristic as well. Um, there may be a view, and you know, I'll go back to societally here, that there may be a view that uh, achieving representation by protected characteristics is about lowering the bar. Could I yes, of course. To be, do, do forgive me, just for the benefit of perhaps people outside our in-group, could you define protected characteristic, please? Yes, Could by all means. The term three times. Yes, by all means. Um, so the protected char characteristics are set out in the 2001 Act, so they include age, gender, sexual orientation, um, race, um, uh, religion and belief, so uh, disabled status. Um, so six, six um, that, that we are concerned with uh, in terms of appointment. Um, so um, there is an obligation on ministers to redress under representation. So fundamentally what you're looking to do in each competition is, is you have two targets to, meet, to uh, meet. One is about the needs of the board in terms of backgrounds, experience, perspective, skills, knowledge, and the other is about protected characteristics where one has underrepresentation. And the purpose of a competition should be to redress 
underrepresentation in relation to both sides of that equation. Um, so, just going back to your original um, point, um, uh, there is there is a feeling, perhaps in society generally, that in order to redress underrepresentation, things like targets are inappropriate because people may feel that merit is already operating effectively, and that well, yes, it's 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 not a position that we agree with clearly. Um, but that people are in the positions that they are in because of merit. Um, again, going back to the Commissioner's point, it's very, very important for Ministers to be clear about what it is that they want at the outset of competitions. Um, merit is what Ministers define it to be for boards. You know, There isn't some ineffable, perfect board member out there, a template which, which we should look to fulfil on each occasion. I hope that answers your question fully. It does. Um, it does. Thank you. And I, I wonder if you have any um, examples of good practice that you could share with us that have resulted in a more diverse recruitment pool? Um, certainly. Um, I think we may have mentioned the competency framework, um, which is a hugely important tool. Um, and it was included in Diversity Delivers for that reason. Um, it's sort of thing that, that's referred to in HR circles as a, an anchored frame of reference. But what it does is it allows ministers and then panels to be very, very clear about what it is that they are seeking and to be clear about the different levels at which perhaps criteria have to be met. And, and perhaps more importantly, to say these are the priorities for this board at this point in time. Um, it was uh, one of our own public appointments advisors, um, because we are capitalising on um, the expertise that they have more and more, as the Scottish Government um, was instrumental in the design of that framework. Her name's Jennifer Hawksworth. Um, I'll name her because credit where it's due. And we worked along with Government to develop that tool. It was, it was trialled on the Creative Scotland appointment round. Um, it would appear from the press release that the um, Cabinet Secretary was particularly happy with the results of that round, not only in terms of meeting the needs of the board, um, but also because uh, it led to a gender-balanced board um, and, and there was a press release about what these new people were bringing. But, you know, equally, we are now looking at a board that's 50% men, 50% women, so it hit the two targets that I referred to. And that framework has been trialled since the summer on different appointment rounds, all to very good effect. Um, it may be worth saying, as I said the last time, we had planned to post some examples of different methods that had been used and the difference that they had made to boards on our website. And, and we have quite a few case studies up there now. Um, we're very happy to send further details to the committee and unless you... Yeah, that'd be helpful. Fine. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be helpful. And are there any barriers still to to, to rolling out that um, method of good practice and appointments? Um, it's a slightly mischievous question, I think. Um, the um, the main barrier, I think, um, in its broadest sense, is capacity. Um, we don't pretend that what we're advocating is necessarily the easiest thing to do. Uh, it will produce the best results, um, but if there are pressures, um, it may be more difficult to achieve that. Um, I'm impressed um, by the commitments made by the government, not only publicly, but also to the resourcing um, of the appointments processes, um, certainly the ones which I've, um, or my office has been involved in, um, that there seems to be a clear uh, desire to change things. Um, and as Ian has said, there are examples of that. Um, I think it's fair to say it won't always succeed. Um, whether they are barriers that people put there deliberately uh, or whether they are just the realities of trying to get on with things, um, I'm not expecting 100% success, but I'm very pleased with the direction of travel. When you, you say capacity, do you mean the capacity as in the numbers of people that put themselves forward or the ability of um, ministers and boards to appoint people? 
By capacity, I mean the amount of resource that's available to the system um, when, it, when it's seeking to uh, appoint people. Do you think more resource should, should be available? I'm not saying more resource should be available. That's not a decision for me to make. But um, if there is not adequate resource, um, that will create a problem. Um, it, if you're planning properly for something, it takes longer than just rushing out and doing it. I'm sorry to be so simplistic, but that is the truth of it. Um, and so what we are advocating and the good practice which we are describing uh, does involve a fair amount of preparation. Um, the logic of the argument is that if that is done properly, the later stages of the process will be easier to handle and will be less difficult and will be less consuming of resources. So overall, in time, um, it will lead to not only more diverse boards with the right sort of people on them, um, but it will also not be a more expensive process. But I think it's fair to say that the transition does involve extra effort and is probably quite difficult to absorb at times. Mm. The, the last part of your answer has answered the question I was about to ask you. As, as the process beds in and people become more used to uh, the different ways of, of, of looking at recruitment pools and generating that diversity, it will, by the very nature of it, become easier and less resource heavy to do. It will. Yes. Um, and if the lessons learned mechanism, which I referred to in my mm. opening statement, uh, works well, and there's no reason to suppose it won't, um, then there will be more information available to people. It will be easier to find, mm -hmm. um, and success, in effect, uh -huh. should breed success. Yeah, and as it becomes standard practice, it becomes something that's onerous is maybe the wrong word to use, but it becomes... That's looking at one part yes. of the process. The other part, of course, is attracting people from diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. and there are different issues there. Yeah, OK. And my final question, um, you'll be pleased to know, is um, how do you... Do you see the monitoring of the, th the thematic review being carried out? How will that be done? Um, I'll pass back to Ian for that, if you don't mind. Certainly. Um, the Commissioner's mentioned the lessons learned um, framework that the government has been developing since the thematic review was published, and uh, we saw an early draft of that in the new year. I don't anticipate that being rolled out, put into practice across the board until probably February, March of this year. Um, and it's only legitimate that we'd want to allow that sufficient time to bed in. Um, but we do have a stage three review planned, uh, and based on that timetable, I'd expect for us to go and have a look at how it's working in practice by doing some field research in March of 2017. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just a, a fairly brief uh, question. Uh, on... Uh, uh, on complaints. Uh, there were 19 complaints uh, your report refers to that were deemed to be inadmissible. And I just wondered if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about why they were inadmissible and should that lead us to any particular conclusions or actions? Um, Convener, yes. Um, I anticipated you asking me that question and I do have the information, but I regret to say I can't lay my hands on it right now. Um, on page 18 of the annual report, um, you will find a breakdown at table 13 at the bottom of the page. Um, 11 of these um, weren't pursued by way of investigation. Five of them, there were no inquiries at all, um, and that means that what had been alleged could not, in any circumstances, amount to a breach of the code. Um, not pursued following f f uh, initial investigation means that having done a bit of inquiry, it was clear that the investigation was, could not lead to a, um, anything that would amount to a breach. Um, and then because some complaints, uh, and we're talking here about councillor and, uh, sorry, we're talking about uh, MSP complaints, um, some are excluded from my jurisdiction um, under the rules which you'll be familiar with. Uh, some are referred to others, so there's a list there um, one was referred both to the presiding officer and to the First Minister, which I think is the first. Um, four were referred to the First Minister because they appeared to relate to um, alleged breaches of uh, the ministerial responsibilities. Um, two were referred to the corporate body. I think they related to alleged um, breaches of um, 
rules regarding uh, members' um, expenses. Um, and one of them, uh, I offered the person who complained the opportunity to have it referred, and they didn't come back to me, so I didn't refer it. I don't refer it unless I've got written authority to do so. Right, that's helpful. Dave Thompson. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Commissioner and uh, team. Um, a number of the points I was going to pick up on have already been uh, covered, but uh, maybe it would be useful for me to find, find out from you um, what kind of volume of change has there been in terms of improvements uh, in the broad sense of, of greater diversity, greater numbers of people coming forward, and so on? Is it a 1%, a 5%, a 10%? Do you have any way of measuring, you know, just how effective it has been? I often come across people who um, are the chair of this or the chair of that and on the board of this and the board of that, and most of them are multiple quangutiers. Uh, so it's, it strikes me that we still have an awful lot of the usual suspects covering an awful lot of the positions, and I accept that it'll take time, you know, for that to change, but do you have a measure over the last few years as these changes have been coming in as to what kind of volume of change there is and how long is it going to be until we, you know, get the real change that we're looking for? Um, convener, can I start by saying that some of these people who are on more than one board may, of course, be extremely able people. Um, that goes without saying, I suspect. Um, we do publish information. Um, the information is provided to us by the government, so it's based on their statistics. Uh, and again, if I can refer to the annual report on page 35, um, there is a table there, table number 24, which is headed demographic, sorry, demographic profile of board membership. Um, and it sets out the um, percentage of board members who are female, disabled, from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, age 49 and under, uh, and from the lesbian, gay, uh, and bisexual um, community. And there are percentages there. We do compare them um, year on year, uh, and that's over the page in Table 25. Um, as you know, the government's priority at the moment has been to increase the, improve the gender balance um, on public boards, and for that matter on private boards, uh, aiming for 50-50 by 2020. Uh, and in Table 25, um, you will see that the percentage of female board members in 2013-14 was 35. Um, it had only increased very slightly from 2004-05, the, the baseline that we take. Uh, it improved in 2014-15 to something over 38%. And I'm told, though the figures haven't yet been published, that the current uh, percentage is 41. Uh, now, 41 um, is significant in terms of being a long way beyond 34.5. Um, it's below 50, but it's above the level uh, set by the European Commission. So I, I'm certainly, from my point of view, that is to be welcomed. Um, I would make the point that my interest is in diversity in a broad sense, um, but I'm very happy that there was progress being made in that sense, and we will continue to report on that year on year. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that. that, that that's very interesting, and, and it is encouraging, and, and uh, I was involved in discussing the diversity delivers and all the rest of it a number of years ago on, on this committee, so I'm pleased that it appears to be having quite a positive effect, and we're moving in the, the right direction. Um, in, in terms of getting a broader spread of people across society, uh, rather than just the specific sort of sections, if you like, uh, that, that you've mentioned, is there evidence to show that people from different um, sections of society in a broader sense are also coming forward now and being appointed? There's some evidence. I, mean, I don't think... We could report on that in in a terribly tidy way. Um, Ian gave some examples earlier on of the sorts of people from a different sections of society who have been recruited to health boards um, in, in recent times. Um, 
I would like to draw attention uh, to the government's public boards and corporate diversity programme. Um, we're plugged into part of that. Um, and that is an attempt reasonably comprehensively uh, to look at all of the different factors that are involved in this, uh, including reaching out to sectors of society who are not currently well represented on boards. Um, and although I don't think we should be looking for instant results, um, I think it's a very good thing that the government is attempting to move forward on all these different fronts, um, because progress in one area without progress in another will lead to the whole thing judging to a halt. To make a very simple example, um, if you had uh, somebody appointed as the chair of a board who was not comfortable with a diverse board, then it patently isn't going to work. Um, so um, things have to move together in parallel, and there are a lot of different factors. Um, so I, in direct answer to your question, I don't think we will be able to produce precisely the sort of information you're looking for, but I think we, and I suspect the government, would be happy to discuss uh, progress with you from mm -hmm. time to time. Mm -hmm. Just before Dave continues, I, I think Mary's got a specific question about Table 24. Yes, yes. Um, please. I have, I have a, a question about a particular group in the, the, the table on page 35, and it's the age 49 and under group. Now, wh while I absolutely understand that the focus has been on, on gender and, and ethnicity, when you have a figure of 17.3% of under 49s are on a, a, a board and they're 54% of the population, I wanted to specifically ask what will be done to improve that. Um, uh, uh, well, I'm glad I mentioned the Public Boards and Corporate Diversity Programme because under that, um, efforts are being made uh, to engage with a, a variety of different groups uh, which involve younger people, including people who are involved in business, um, and in the charity, the third sector, if you like, um, who will have experience that is relevant but might not have considered putting themselves forward. Now, we're, well, actually, we've participated in some meetings, but we're not directly responsible for or, or driving this, but um, I think it's fair to say the government is well aware of the issue and is trying to take steps to, to address it. I mean, is there a specific issue in the perception that people have of boards and board membership? The under 49s don't apply. Um, it's an artificial cutoff, but I suspect you're right. Mm -hmm. so or, or are they just too busy at that stage in the career <laughs> doing other things? They, they, they may be too busy for a number of reasons. Um, and and one, of the, one of the issues is the nature of people's perception of boards, but another is the reality of board membership. What are you required to do? Um, how much time commitment is involved? Is that made clear? Uh, when are meetings held? Um, where are meetings held? So all these things uh, come into play, but I, I suspect the, the basic question is hitting the nail on the head. OK, thank you. Now, I know Patricia's going to come back more specifically on diversity, uh, but I was okay. just going to say to Dave if we could uh, focus on some right, of the, right. the, the other issues. Yeah, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of um, continue uh, along the same lines, in a sense, in terms of um, the number of people who are on multiple boards and so on. Um, now, many of these will be unpaid positions. Uh, they won't be paid positions. Some <coughs> of them will be paid positions, and they'll be very well paid for, for a, a few days a month, and that's not for for me to, or, or, or yourselves to, or this committee to, to comment on directly. Um, do you think there's a case, I mean, I think there's maybe been a temptation in the past and it's been very easy for people who, once they get into the system, for the thing to be kind of self-perpetuating. And this is why diversity delivers and all the rest of it is, is necessary and we need the change. Would there be a case for limiting the number of boards that individuals could be members of or limiting the number of chairs of, of boards that they, they can hold? Um, or is it actually necessary for some of these people, if they're giving up time and they're not working and they can't hold down a full-time job because they're on boards, they actually need to be on a number of boards to get an income to, to, to live? Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, um, if, if a limit would be useful or if that's something you think is not relevant at all. 
Can I answer this obliquely uh, and then directly? Um, the government is also at the moment looking more carefully at reappointments than it did in the past, uh, and this is what I referred to at the outset in terms of looking at the planning of um, the appointment process, not just at the setting of a competition at the point where a vacancy occurs. So thinking ahead, looking at the strategic requirements, the operational context, um, and considering whether the people currently on the board are the right people to be re there in, in three years' time or whatever. Um, so there will probably be a lower percentage of reappointments than has been the position in the past. That may or may not have an impact on the number of people who are on multiple boards, at least the number of boards that they're on. Uh, but to answer your question directly, I think there's a risk in applying a limit. Um, it, it would inevitably be an artificial limit. Um, and if somebody who was already at that limit put themselves forward for something and they appeared to be precisely the right person for it, the consequence of appointing them or trying to appoint them would be they would have to resign from something else, which would create... Um, a vacancy that wasn't planned for, uh, and then you're into this whole resourcing issue of trying to do the job properly. So um, I can see arguments for and against. I wouldn't personally be keen to argue for a limit at this stage. I'd need to be convinced that it, that it would work. OK, thank you for, thank you for that. Um, I wonder if you can comment. Uh, you mentioned that the, the new approach has been well received by, by all involved, um, and uh, we noticed that the Public Appointments and Diversity Centre of expertise, PACE, uh, has, has now changed its, its name to Public Appointments, Wellbeing and Diversity. Um, can you maybe just explain a wee bit to us how their role has changed, or has it changed, or have um, they just changed the name? I, again, I think I'll ask Ian to go into the, the, more of the detail of that, but just to update you, uh, in next year's annual report, they will be the Public Appointments team. Their name has changed again. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, Right enough, they have been rebranded again. Um, it's, it's now the public appointments team, in it, and that very much reflects their role. They are wholly dedicated to public appointments and, and nothing else. Um, I have to say I've been really impressed by, um, first of all, the level of understanding that there now exists within that team. Um, I, I did indicate, I think we said in the annual report, they had a new head of the public appointments team, uh, and again, credit where it's due, her, her name is Eva McLaren, although I normally hesitate to, to name an official. Um, she is uh, very understanding of what it is that we're engaged in, very dedicated to that activity, um, and has drawn together a team and, and strengthened the existing team. There's a new um, development manager um, called, again, credit where it's due, Kirsty Walker, and um, we have been working with them on developing um, an action plan under strand two of the um, public boards and corporate diversity program board which is about addressing underrepresentation on the boards of scotland's public bodies the last time we gave evidence we said that a number of recommendations in diversity delivers hadn't been implemented and subsequently sent uh, an indication to the committee of, of those that we felt had been in abeyance. Um, the action plan now looks to address, you know, a whole raft of things that, that hadn't been implemented to date, and we are working very closely together on doing that. It, and it isn't just about the appointments process. It's much, much broader than that. So I, along with uh, members of EV's team, um, you know, we spoke earlier about um, perhaps attracting people who hadn't thought about roles under the age of 50. We ran a couple of events along with Equate Scotland. Um, so that's for young women in science, engineering and technology subjects to encourage them to apply for board roles. So, it's, you know, it's not just work on the process. It's much wider. We have a detailed action plan, I'm sure, with the government's permission if the committee were interested to have a look at that we could provide it to you um, but um, you know we have assigned people for all of those activities we have dates by which they all have to be achieved uh, and we are very much working in partnership uh, with a view to um, meeting very much what is um, you know a shared um, outcome um, 
there's no adversarial relationship. We are still very much guardians of the code, guardians of the principle. Um, but I think there is that understanding there on their part as well that our activities, the activities of our public appointments advisors, uh, are all with a view to meeting ministerial aims uh, and getting the best possible people for boards. Um, so I, I'm very, very heartened by the work that we've been doing with them. Well, thank you very much for that. It's very encouraging to, to hear that things have progressed so well in, in uh, recent years, um, because it, it wasn't always thus, you know, and uh, these things do take time to to sort of bed in and change. So it, uh, it is encouraging to hear what you're saying, and let's hope that progress continues as uh, the years move on. Thank you, Convener. Can I just say, in terms of management, um, we want to step up the pace a little bit, um, and uh, I'm intending now to allow Patricia to ask some questions. Good morning. Um, I listened very with, with great interest to the previous conversations about diversity and it is good to see progress being made and I noted also that um, within the report uh, it was mentioned that you were cautiously optimistic about the, the trends but um, table 24 demonstrates that all of the target groups are still underrepresented so I wondered whether um, you have considered any, um, well, let me put it another way, whether you've, you've, you've looked at the, the, the things that have worked and the things that haven't worked, and if you could perhaps give us an example of the good practice that is helping to make a difference, and whether if it works in one area or for one target group, it could be rolled out to others, or is that what is happening? Um, Convener, I think uh, I'm conscious that you're slightly concerned about time. Um, we, we've already, I think... I don't think we need to get too concerned. Okay. I'm just well, alerting my colleagues. I'm keeping an eye. Um, Ian has previously referred to um, the example of the Creative Scotland round, um, which led to people um, with a passion for the arts and, in Scotland and in the wider world being appointed and also to a, um, a balanced board in terms of gender. Um, <laughs> And he's referred to um, a developing practice, I think it's fair to say, uh, within NHS appointment rounds, um, where a much broader um, range of people are being attracted to put themselves forward and, and are being appointed to boards. Um, but I think these are good examples. Um, I accept that all of the groups remain underrepresented, so I'm not complacent about this. Uh, but all of the things I've said before, I hope, indicate that I think there is a lot of positive work being done. Uh, there is a lot of positive attention being addressed to the issue. Um, and the signs are that things are moving in the right direction. The lessons learned mechanism, which we've referred to a couple of times beforehand, should do precisely what you uh, outlined at the beginning of your question uh, and make it possible, easier for people to see what has worked well. Of course, circumstances will vary um, and it would be a great pity if um, we got to the point where whatever had worked, say, in NHS Tayside, just to pick an example, was then seen as the model for everything else. Um, it shouldn't develop that way. Can I just... Uh, that's fine. OK. I am very conscious, though, that the, the, the figures for women are getting better. But the figures for disabled people and, and people under 49 not moving in the same direction as quickly. And I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm just expressing a slight anxiety that perhaps there is understandably a focus on increasing women's representation and hoping that we're not losing sight of the other target groups, but that you know, work is also being done to make sure that they are coming forward and being appointed because their issues will, on some occasions at least, be very different from the issues that prevent women from taking part. And, you know, the one approach doesn't necessarily fit all. Um, I don't know if it gives you any com um, comfort. I share your anxiety. Um, having said that, I very much welcome the high-profile attention that's been given to the gender imbalance, because that, I think... Um, opens the door to consideration of issues of diversity in a way that it wouldn't otherwise occur. Um, certainly my office um, 
and if you speak to the public appointments advisors, some of them are quite passionate about this, um, are very interested in diversity in a much broader sense. Um, so we're not thinking that the problem's been addressed, far from it. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, Convener, my next question is a slightly different one, so I'm not sure whether this, this would be an appropriate point for Fiona to come in. Fiona, I think it would. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm just interested in this, you know, the conversation about the profile um, of needing diversity has definitely been raised and been accepted by so many. But in your thematic review, because I'm interested in the, the actual process, page 13 of the th thematic review, where we talk about publicity, how do we get the applicants? First, we have to look at where do we put the application out and therefore is it a, a, in an, a space that attracts more diversity to look at the, appl the application in the first place. And you talk about it very much being centred on, what is it called, the Scotland Applies website? Appointed for Scotland Point. website. And it's then part of that other process as well as having applied, having seen the advert, how do you apply? Are we bringing in different ways? We talked about this the last time you were here, and I just wondered if you have any um, examples of a more creative way of putting out an appointment and then allowing people to apply for it. Sorry, okay. go. Uh, there has been some inertia there, uh, I think it's fair to say. So uh, once people are in the process, I think there has been more proliferation of different methods, techniques. Um, I mentioned our action plan earlier on, so one of the key things I think that's appeared in that for the first time and, and is due to be rolled out this year is a social media strategy. And that again speaks, I think, to you know the attraction of people under the age of 50. So it's not a thing that's been rolled out yet. But again, I just, you know, I, I had a copy of the draft strategy in the last week uh, and I'm very, very encouraged by that. That's not to say that specific techniques have not been used to attract target groups. They, they certainly have, and they've been used on a range of rounds. And again, it is about underrepresentation by protected characteristic. The commissioner's guidance was altered, as you know, uh, and you know a draft provided to the committee. It's very explicit that um, the outcome is about meeting all the needs of the board and that part and parcel of that, in terms of learning lessons, is protect all protected characteristics. So you have to look at whether or not you attracted disabled people, you know, a fifth of the population to apply for these roles. And if you weren't successful at doing so, what do you have to do differently next time in order to achieve that? Um, but um, I'll choose one example. Again, there are others on the website. For the enterprise bodies, they understood that they had underrepresentation by gender. And so a thing that they did was that they held open days and encouraged women who belonged to, um, I think, um, changing the chemistry, the IOD, you know, to come and find out more about these roles, people who wouldn't necessarily have thought about applying for those positions. So it's not as though there aren't lots of pockets of good practice out there. Um, it really is just a matter of widening that net. But I'll get that on your website. I can go and... Yes. Thank yeah. you. Bye, Tina. Um, I was very interested in Table 27 on page 37, uh, where it tells us how many people applied and then how many people got through the process at various levels and were actually appointed. And I was struck by the fact that some 1,742 people had applied and that of those, 431 got as far as interview, which would suggest that they perhaps were people who were considered to have at least some merit and ability and, and to fit all the, the criteria that we had. But of that, just under a quarter were actually appointed. And I, I just wonder whether there's any process that uh, allows those people who are not appointed to have some feedback about what the reasons were for them not being appointed, because presumably if they got as far as being invited to interview, then they had some merit and, and ability, and they may be people who wouldn't fit the criteria for a particular appointment, but might have abilities that would fit very well for another. And I wouldn't want to see people being um, discouraged by not being able to progress through the process, given the numbers that we have in the process itself. 
That's absolutely correct. Um, and in some of the discussions I've been involved in, there's very clearly uh, a heightened awareness um, of the opportunities to, um, as it were, retain people in, in retain people's interest by giving them better feedback um, if they're not successful. There have been some very good examples as well, I should say. Um, and there's also, um, I think, an awareness that um, in an exercise where, uh, as we've already been um, identifying, there are certainly sectors of the population who are unlike, less likely to be interested, um, where these people do put themselves forward, it's very important to try and retain that interest and uh, encourage them to put themselves forward again. So there's an awareness. Uh, there is some developing practice, but I think it's fair to say that there's certainly quite a lot of scope for improvement there yet. Okay. I think that would be an interesting one to, to follow. Um, two points arising from questions that colleagues asked earlier. I, I was um, struck by a, a good point uh, Mr Thompson made uh, about people's um, paid appointment to boards. But I wondered if you had any uh, statistics that could explain how many board appointments are remunerated as opposed to being given expenses and whether that is... Uh, some kind of barrier or encouragement, in fact, to, to appointment or to application? We don't hold that information. Um, I, I think it is available on the uh, Appointed for Scotland website, but not gathered uh, in a way that would answer your question neatly. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to volunteer to do that in the okay. short term, uh, but it's maybe something we could try and uh, do for a, another time. Yeah. I think it would be quite interesting to know whether remuneration was a, a factor, I suppose, in well, people's decision to become involved. I'm sorry, there, are, there are some people who effectively have a career, this is back to Mr Thompson's point, effectively have a career on boards, which is not in itself wrong. Um, they may be uh, contributing extremely effectively. Um, I, there will be other people for whom being involved is more important than the remuneration. Um, I'm not quite sure how we would get that information. That, that's why I'm hesitant about provide, trying to provide statistics. I, I think probably well, that's something we might ask our own spice mm. uh, to, to look at for us. Mm. Um, and, and my, my final question uh, to you this morning is, um, the convener mentioned or raised with you the issue of inadmissible complaints, the 19 complaints that had come forward. And I was struck by the fact that a number of them were referred on to more appropriate uh, locations. I wondered whether you, as an organisation, get any feedback as to the outcome of those referrals? Sometimes we do, um, and sometimes we don't. Um, certainly, um, I don't think there have been any more recent examples. The, the previous Permanent Secretary's office um, were in the practice of sending a copy of whatever the final letter was to my office for our records. Um, not that we would do anything with it or could do anything with it. Um, I, there just haven't been any uh, more recently, so I'm, I'm presuming that practice will continue. Um, whilst I'm interested, I, I have no role in relation to those, so um, there's actually nothing I, will, I can do with it. And if you were <laughs> going to ask me what I thought of the uh, information I'd receive. I really can't make a comment, I'm afraid. No, 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 no I, I wasn't going to do that. I just was interested to know whether you, having referred it on, you got feedback as to how the matter had been handled and the outcome. In that sense, we do, yes. That's helpful to know. Thank you. <coughs> Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, everybody. <coughs> uh, I'm going to ask you questions in relation to accessibility for the public uh, to be able to uh, complain. And uh, I know that the Act requires allegations uh, um, to be made in writing and also signed. But your recommendation of what you're going to operate, you're going to change that and you're going to allow people to complain uh, uh, using uh, IT methods through email, etc. So I wonder, does the benefit of allowing the complaints to be submitted online outweigh the potential risk uh, of acting out with the statutory competence? I, um, my short answer to that is 
I think so, otherwise I wouldn't have put it forward as I have done in the um, draft of the strategic plan. Um, behind that, there's a slightly more complex picture, as with all of these things, unfortunately. Um, if the complaint is about a member of this parliament uh, and it is unsigned, um, I have to submit a report to you, uh, to this committee, um, s seeking instructions and direction as to whether or not to proceed with it. Um, if it's a complaint about a councillor or a member of a, a public body, um, they, that separate act um, only states, it requires that as far as possible, I will only investigate complaints which are signed, uh, which are in writing and signed. Um, the legal definition of writing has moved on, uh, even since 2000, um, to the point where I think uh, an online um, complaint could be treated as written. Um, the difficulty is in relation to signature. Um, my view is that the risk of proceeding inappropriately with an investigation is very small. Um, I haven't yet, uh, in the period I've been in office, uh, received any complaints which appear to be completely frivolous. Um, some of them, you think, are so far outside my jurisdiction that I would think, I'm not sure why they come to me, but I haven't received any which are, you know, somebody pretending to be Mr. C. Lyon uh, or, or whatever. Um, so I, it hasn't been an issue up to now. And when we do investigate, we have a, quite a lot of contact, backwards and forwards, whether it's reciprocal or <laughs> go back to the discussion earlier on, um, or, or some other arrangement. Um, we, I think it would be very difficult for somebody to maintain a completely spurious complaint uh, throughout the process. Um, and I think if I had any doubts, um, I would be actually asking to speak to them. So that's a long way of saying I don't think the risk is very high. If it's an MSP complaint, I will have to come to you anyway, uh, and you can direct me whether or not to proceed, uh, or your successors anyway. Um, if it's not an MSP complaint, I think the risk is very low. I'm looking at it from a slightly different angle here, though. Um, if someone, if the requirement was that it should, it should be in writing and should be signed, and I understand your point with regards to email, etc. I understand that point, and it makes complete sense. But if that is signed, if a complaint was made against an MSP, could the MSP themselves say, "Well, you're not, you're not complying"? Could it be stopped in its tracks because it would seem to me under the law? The requirement is it should be signed. If it's not signed, how can it move forward? Well, and uh, would it not be, would it not be, you know, better to seek that the? I actually agree with you, by the way. So it's not, not, not I'm not trying to put an obstacle in your way. But would it not be better to seek that the that the act be amended, or or can it be amended? Is it something that was passed to this to in, in, in the Scotland Act? Or is it something we have the competence to, to change um, here? This, this Parliament would have. I mean, it's a, an act of the Scottish Parliament in the first place. Um, so it could certainly be amended here. Um, as I say, with MSP complaints, if, it, if they are unsigned, I will have to come to this committee or its successor uh, to seek authority to proceed or directions as to whether or not to proceed. Um, I'm not sure what the value is of a signature. Some signatures are completely illegible. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think we have to think carefully about um, all governments that I'm aware of um, are seeking to move to digital provision of services. Um, and I think there has to be an assessment of the risk of not requiring a signature. And I think that will be something for this committee or its successor to make a decision on um, if I do bring to you uh, a report saying that I have this um, complaint which in all other respects meets the requirements but is not signed. Right, um, okay. I'm not sure if that answers the question. No, it, does, it certainly does. I, I, I think you're quite right to put it on to us to have a look at this actually and, and uh, square the circle. I, the other thing is that you've already mentioned the additional investments required for the re re renewal of your, your IT system but I, I wondered over and above that uh, what, uh, if any at all, uh, what scale of the resources that will be required uh, uh, to alter the relevant uh, systems uh, to deliver these changes over and above the IT system? 
Convener, I may have to be a little bit coy on this in part because we will be going to tender. Um, and I, I, we're very reluctant to discuss figures. Um, can, I, can I just say, if you're going to tender in early course, then simply we should leave that. Uh, uh, provided I have the backing, financial backing to do so, yes, which I don't yeah, yet. In, in, indeed. So much. Can, um, can I just ask a, a, a simple straightforward question because uh, Commissioner raised it and you have raised it also and it is the increase in complaints with regards to councillors. Has the complaints being upheld also increased? That would be nice to hear. Um, I, th I think percentage wise um, the number of complaints being upheld is reasonably static. Um, I think the highest number of complaints received, sorry, highest number of cases, if I can talk about, remember, we, in the 1415 annual report we refer to a complaint in Aberdeen where we had 524 complaints. It's all about the one issue, so that was one case. So it's distorting the figures. Um, but the highest number of cases that have been considered by the office came in in 2013-14. Uh, there was a dip in that sense in 14-15, although the complexity has gone up. Uh, we are now heading back to 2013-14 um, levels, um, and I don't see any sign of it tailing off. But the two things get up together, the complaints Yes, and, um, and, you can look at the number of um, hearings held by the Standards Commission where uh, I've reported to them that there's been a breach. Right. Um, and percentage-wise, that doesn't change. I mean, the numbers are very small, but the percentage-wise, it doesn't change very much. So I don't think it's an indication of rampant bad behaviour. I, th I think it's um, just the volume of complaints. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. Um, maybe just an observation. I'm fairly confident that uh, we've already got legislation that provides for electronic signatures uh, in other jurisdictions. And, uh, and we've also, as a committee, recently just been through standing orders and codes of conduct to make it clear that in writing shouldn't be restricted to the physical process of uh, an imprint on a, on, a, on a page. So, But to give certainty, it might be something our successors as a committee uh, would look at uh, doing something about by a committee bill. Certainly not for this session of Parliament. Uh, anyway, finally, Cameron Buchanan. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just interested in what you said earlier about the changes in working practices which has contributed to the, to the um, reduction in the number of reported concerns. Um, is there a significant fall in the number of reported concerns? Um, convener, I'd like to ask Ian Bruce, who, who deals with the inquiries. I presume we're talking about public appointments here. Um, yes, I, I think we indicated in the annual report um, that, um, in, in part at least, that's going to be due to the amount of oversight that we provide, although you know that, that doesn't mean that we're hugely concerned. As the Commissioner indicated, where issues do arise on rounds on which we aren't providing direct oversight, officials do actually pick up the phone to the office and say, you know, uh, there's been an instance of maladministration. How do we address it? So, um, you know, in that respect, that, that's not a huge concern. I think our closer working relationship, I think the fact that there's a clearer understanding that the advice that our advisors provide in the field is uh, welcome and helpful in terms of achieving ministerial aims. I think these things are contributing to the reduction in the number of concerns. We also have to bear in mind that there were fewer appointment rounds live during the year, perhaps in comparison to previous years, uh, and inevitably that's going to have an impact also uh, in terms of the number of reports that come to the office. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to commit myself to say, you know, we are now looking in perpetuity at fewer concerns necessarily coming to us. Uh, our position has always been where our folks are involved uh, in appointment activity. Uh, that's always with a view to addressing issues as they arise, um, which is why you know we don't appear before the committee with reports because you know we are there to ensure to facilitate compliance on an ongoing basis. Hmm. Thank you. I'm also, following on from that. You know, we passed two bills this, this process, the lobbying bill and the interest of members of the Scottish Parliament. And I was really wondering, what impact will there be on staffing and other resources? Uh, 
just for clarity, we've only got stage one on lobbying. Yeah. We may or may Fine, not pass but I, that. Still, I think I can still ask the question. Oh, no, the question is relevant, but just for that. the record. But it's going to happen, so... <laughs> All right. Convener, I think the, um, the impact clearly will depend on the volume of issues uh, which we have to investigate, and that doesn't answer your question, I realise. Um, I have assumed, in fact, I've given evidence to this committee, um, I have assumed that the number of complaints received will be a handful. If it is a handful, whilst there will be an additional cost in dealing with them, I'm sure we will find a way of dealing with them. Um, but as I've already said, we are at capacity. Um, we really are, in terms of the range of things that we are looking at on the um, standards and complaints side. So if there is a large volume, I don't know what we'll do, uh, is the honest answer. Um, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, uh, and I'm hoping that we do have a new case management system which allows us to uh, streamline our administration and generates a lot of material automatically, which will uh, reduce the amount of time taken. IT system, you're talking it's about. part of the IT system, yes. There are other issues, but we don't need to go into that today. Um, so we're trying to make improvements in our efficiency. We've already done so. Uh, we will continue to try to do so. Um, but we will have to hope for the best that the volume of complaints is not large. Okay, thank you. That's fine. Uh, that uh, brings us to the end of uh, the questions we'd previously discussed uh, to put to you. Um, is there anything of uh, significance that we have not covered that you want to draw to our attention, Bill? No, thank you, Convener. That's been a fairly extensive canter around the field, I think. Thank you. Well, in that case, may I thank all three of you for uh, uh, attending and helping our uh, consideration of uh, matters related to public appointments, etc. Um, that's been very helpful. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, thank you. I now move the meeting into private session.